the Chinese Communist Party believes the law of the jungle. The might make it right. It has never changed. So don't expect uh, economic engagement somehow going to change them. No, they have a very singular goal. They want to make a, this a Sino-centric world order, replace the liberal world order we have, so everybody will buy to the Chinese you know, authoritarian rule. And we have to recognize that, knowing, be realistic, knowing we can never change that. But, we can, but at the same time, we can do things to support Chinese people. We don't really understand what we have here in the United States until somebody from outside comes here and says, you don't want to do what happened in the last place. Helen Raleigh has been a, a good friend for a long time. She has now written more books than I've ever read, but that's only four, but still, her latest backlash. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. Um, you grew up in China. Mm -hmm. You got out in, late, in the late uh, 90s. Be before we dive into this, you once told me you see this country turning into China, or you, you, there's a lesson there that we're not seeing. What is that lesson? It's the growing ro uh, romanticization of uh, socialism. It really bothers me that uh, socialism has failed China. It kills millions of people in China, including some of my families. It happened only a few decades ago, yet I've seen that more and more embracement here in the United States about socialism. The rising tide of socialism is really troubling. I don't know why Americans want to give up free market and freedom to embrace a totalitarian regime. You know, somebody looks at you and goes, Helen, come on, those are communists. We are lovable democratic socialists. We're not communists. You are confusing the two. Democratic socialism is an oxymoron. It's a bait and switch scam. It's like putting lipstick on a pig. It's still a pig. And you think that democratic socialism is as authoritarian as, as China and the former Soviet Union? There is no gentler or better version of socialism. Democratic socialism, a good example is Venezuela. Now, they democratically elect the dictator, and now, on average, the population lost about 20 pounds because of food shortage. Guess what? There were food shortages in China. I grew up with food shortage. There were food shortages in Soviet Union. There were food shortages in Cuba. Socialism, no matter where it was practiced, where it was implemented, it always ends up in the same equally distributed misery. I heard one person say, democratic socialism is Communism with a happier face. Um, I like that one, too. All right, let's talk about, uh, if I can ask you about COVID. Yes. Yeah, because it was about a year ago we were hearing the news mm -hmm. about China and COVID. Um, and I said, I thought that out of all this, China could be the winner in the COVID post-COVID world. Why? They, they're the ones who unleashed it. They're the ones who have the totalitarian government, so their mm -hmm. people are compliant. You stay home. We beat it. And even if it kills millions of people in China, which it might have, mm -hmm. because we can't trust the numbers, right. they've, got, they've got a billion point three people and, and the government doesn't care about human life. Right. And they win immunity earlier mm -hmm. and they spread it around and they've locked down their economic competitors, including the United States. You know, so we're, we're not working. So it seems to me that China might win. And what I mean by when they might benefit when all is said and done from COVID. You think I'm right? Well, I kind of disagree with you. On the surface, it seems like China is the winner. It seems like the uh, COVID is under control in China. Like you said, we don't know the true right. information. Even if China had the COVID under control, but I think China is one of the biggest losers of the COVID uh, pandemic for several reasons. Number one is this COVID pandemic has become a wake-up call for a lot of people and a lot of governments. If you look at the Pew Research of Public Opinions, China's um, public image, public opinion of China has dropped to historical low. The majority of people around the world blame the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party for being responsible for the spread of the pandemic. Are you saying, I mean, those of us who kind of follow this, we know China lies. We know they never tell the truth to the international community. They never mm -hmm. tell the truth to their own people. Right. I found it fascinating that their numbers are so undependable as far as their oil storage. 
that they, we don't know how much oil they have, that people in the business actually pay for satellite time to look down at their oil tanks and judge by the shadows what, what their oil is. So that is more accurate than the numbers that they come out with. And so you're saying COVID might bring that message to other people and other governments around the world. Hey, you can't trust these people. You can't trust this government, not the people. Mm-hmm. And, and you think people are now more skeptical about what's going on in China. It's not just a skeptical. It's also people realize that when bad things happen in China, it doesn't stay there. It goes everywhere else because the studies show this COVID pandemic is totally containable. If China shared information with the rest of the world, accurate information, have the transparent information shared with the world much, much sooner, if, if they did that six, six weeks sooner, the pandemic would be reduced by 90%, 90%. I heard that they learned their lesson from SARS, where they lied and lied and lied and lied. And this time around, they were much more open about uh, sharing with the world the health problem that they unleashed. No, they were forced to share the information. It was the Wall Street Journal first broke out about this mysterious pneumonia in China. And the local media also reported that's when they were forced to inform. Actually, they didn't inform WHO. It's the WHO's field office read the news report, then asked their Chinese contact. They were forced to come clean. And they didn't even come completely clean either for weeks they keep telling the rest of the world, oh, there's no evidence yeah. of human-to-human transmission, which is not true. They, they, they know. All right, you talk about, in, in Backlash, you talk about the aggression of China. And um, so let's define that. What do you see as China's aggression? I see it's tr- uh, aggression both domestically and internationally. Domestically, it represents China's aggression represented by its uh, suppression of its people. The people including the Uyghur Muslims, the internment of millions of Uyghur Muslims, the forced labor of Uyghur Muslims, and its crash of a dissent. Excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought Donald Trump was the only person mean to Muslims. Donald Trump was not mean to the Muslims. Donald Trump actually signed the Uyghur Muslim Human Rights Act. Donald Trump uh, uh, is also, I, I think the, uh, the U.S. Congress is also considered another act to protect the Uyghur forced laborers. Well, I don't hear about this. I didn't keep going. <laughs> So, so domestically, the, the, Chi- the Chinese Communist Party suppressed dissent, suppressed Chinese people. They also built this enormous high-tech surveillance state. So keep an eye on 1.4 billion people's movement, and even their thoughts and their ideas, expressions. And that now has expanded outside its borders. So the aggression expanded outside the borders in South China Sea. You see the crackdown in Hong Kong and the military threat in Taiwan, as well as, you know, um, put other countries in, in, into huge debt to China through their belt and road infrastructure project. Can I ask you about Hong Kong? And that in the United States, when the handoff was happening, uh, I'm trying to remember if it was in the 80s, and there was a guarantee of 50 years of one country, two systems. Um, and We wondered why the UK didn't try to keep its territory so those people on that island could be free. And quite simply, they didn't have the money. They 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 wouldn't they wouldn't stand up for it. But the idea was at least we have half a century. That's a long time where guaranteed rights, free speech, free press, people can dissent, people can own property, they can do these things. And now now, all that seems to be crumbling, absolutely crumbling. Um, that, for me, is aggression. That is, they are, they are throwing away what they've agreed to, and they were going to get control anyway, so they're just speeding it up with throwing some people in jail. What's wrong? They had no interest to keep that, their end of the bargain, the promise they made to, from the beginning. And I have a chapter here in my book about Hong Kong. I give a lot of background information why United Kingdom uh, signed the agreement and, and what happened since the handover and the, and, and the agreement signed uh, in the handover in 1997. So 
it's truly tragic what's happening in Hong Kong right now. Hong Kong used to be on top of the Freedom Index. It's one of the freest places on this whole planet. It has, it, it's the shiny example of what the magic the free market can do. It was the easiest place yes. in the world to start a business and right. have Low equal tax. protection of the laws with the least amount of regulation, mm -hmm. which is why it exploded and turned into that economic power. Right. Where is it now? Now it's, it's no different than a totalitarian state. I, like today, you know, we all heard the sad news that the three young uh, Hong Kong activists, student leaders, they were sentenced to various, uh, you know, um, prison, uh, prison sentence. They received a prison sentence today for leading protests last year. Remember how last year we were also inspired by the peaceful protest in Hong Kong. Yeah, millions of people walked down the street. Yeah, yeah. and now there were these three young leaders are held responsible. I remember, I remember these hopeful moments. Tiananmen, before Tiananmen Square, another hopeful movement of, of people in China mm -hmm. rising up and demanding human basic rights, um, uh, and then it getting squashed. And Hong Kong, where we saw these people demanding their autonomy, and it got squashed. And with all these examples, I get an attitude from, from my distance of China going, what are you going to do about it? What, we are now an economic powerhouse, second to the United States. Mm -hmm. We don't care about human life. We, we will sacrifice as many, and we've got as many. What are you going to do about it? That's, that's the attitude I, I sense as the official Chinese attitude. How off am I? I? I actually think you're right. That's her attitude. But I think that attitude used to, uh, for many governments, they used to just suck it up to that attitude because they want a, a share of China's economic growth. But uh, since COVID-19, we see there are more and more governments, especially our U.S. allies, has taken a stand and pushing back. For example, in Australia, um, in April, Australia proposed and basically led over 100 countries to demand that the WHO do an investigation on how the coronavirus was originated and you know how, how it was spread. And for that courageous act, they were uh, Australia is being punished by China right now through economic means. Yet, the more China is bullying Australia, the more the rest of the world are waking up to what kind of bully this economic power is, the more they are rallying behind the Trump administration. I know you don't hear this from the mainstream <laughs> media, but it's actually true. Trump administration is not doing this alone. They are, con they are leading a confrontational policies to China because they are waiting to take the lead. Now you see all other countries, United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, or allies starting to also react and join behind. So there is a united front is being building to push back on China's aggression. That sounds optimistic, but as a kid who was raised during the Cold War, you know, looking back at it, I saw the Soviet Union, looking back, they were economically in ruins. Mm -hmm. And it was Ronald Reagan who decided to push them over the edge. Say, really? Co try to keep up with us on, on our military spending. Try to keep up with us and it'll push you over the edge. I don't see that with China because they mm -hmm. are a manufacturing powerhouse. They have adopted capitalism that, but as long as they run it. It's almost a fascism. They, you know, so we can go there, build our stuff, they make money, mm -hmm. and I wonder if the Soviet Union had an endless amount of money, they'd be China. And that's, right. that's the long-term worry I have. To, talk to me a little bit about Taiwan. I mean, you, you mentioned that Taiwan is part of this backlash. I don't understand. Well, I think if they are a winner out of the pandemic, it's definitely Taiwan. Taiwan is less than 100 miles from mainland China. And every month, millions of mainland Chinese um, travel to Taiwan. Yet, and uh, Taiwan is also densely populated with 24 million residents on this small island. Yet, so far, Taiwan has only 600 cases, as well as like uh, seven deaths. Taiwan has done an amazing job, and Taiwan managed to do achieve this, you know, great achievement without shutting down schools without shutting down businesses, without closing restaurants and bars. So Taiwan is How a shiny example. That? 
So basically, the couple of things they did right. Number one, they did the things they did right was that they took a decisive actions early. As soon as they heard the news about there's a mysterious pneumonia in China, the Taiwanese official did not wait for any more evidence. They started to board the uh, incoming plane to check everybody's temperatures and looking for symptoms. And so that's one thing. Was that authoritarian? So did they use kind of Chinese type regulations to, to crack down? No, no, no. They just took actions early. They check everybody's temperature, looking for symptoms. But you know, but it's not it, it's not authoritarian. And they also the second thing, which is something we should have done, is differentiate treatment based on the risk level of each person, rather than have this indiscriminating lockdown. Okay. They, you know, if you're young and healthy, you can pass the custom quickly, get on your life. But if you're in high risk, they're going to check on you, make sure you're quarantined, you know, 14 days. And if you have symptoms, they're going to make sure you go to a hospital to get treated. By Taiwan is a shining example of how a free society can address a pandemic without, you know, without infringing people's rights, at least to keep the infringement at the minimum. The title backlash, you seem to think that that their aggression, China's aggression, mm -hmm. is backfiring. You really need to convince me of that. So Taiwan has done a great job. Hong Kong is getting swallowed up. Mm -hmm. uh, Chinese people have no freedoms. They are followed. They are under surveillance. There's facial recognition. The technological revolution has has imprisoned them. They mm -hmm. they can't get news. Mm -hmm. um, they VPNs virtual private networks so that they could uh, go into a, virtually right. go into another country and read the news. That's against the law, and they could go to prison just mm -hmm. for that. Speakers like you and critics like you are on on lists. Mm -hmm. um, how, do you feel optimistic that liberty will actually? come to China over time? I mean, I, I can't help but feel pessimistic. Well, I think the backlash is not just about the liberty coming to China. I think the backlash, the first stage, is the liberal uh, you know, nations needs to wake up, have the courage to stand up to China, to push back for its aggression, first internationally, then you know, domestic, you know, in the domestic. And in the past, because the cost of pushing back uh, most, one of the most powerful countries so high, very few countries, including the United States, were not, was not willing to do it. But the Trump administration, again, you know, doesn't matter what you think about his uh, other leadership style. The Trump administration really made a 180 turnaround. Instead of treating China as what we wish them to look like, you know, to in the past several decades, think how, you know, as long as they keep economic engagement, someday, you know, the the hamburger right. theory, someday they're going to become more like us. What's more the hamburger theory? The hamburger theory basically say, you know. Um, as long as there's a McDonald's, doesn't matter right. which culture and the political you know system it is. Eventually, the world is gonna emerge, you know, merge into one big happy family. We're all gonna be like you know each other, and that's not the case happening in China. So what the Trump administration did was they 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 have they brought this realism into a new China policy. You know. You, they were, you know, they were criticized by the Democrat, say, oh, you know, they're so confrontational. But the confrontation has already started from the China. The only, you know, previous administration all the way to the Obama administration refused to push back. And then the Trump administration first, it was the first one to put a stop. And then, that, and then you see behavior, then you see behavior change. That's why as a free market supporter, it took me a while to understand why Trump started the trade war. Because China, has no doesn't have much territorial ambition because they think it's costly, but as the uh, one of the most powerful economic power, they have every intention to use their economic weapon to make a country abide by their will, and the Trump administration recognized that. That's why they used the trade war to force China to come to the negotiation table to say, you have to change. You cannot force our companies to share technology with you. You cannot steal our technologies without being punished. You have to open your markets to us, just like how we open our markets to you. Let me, let me running out of time, let me, let me ask you this. In the most basic terms, mm -hmm. if you're talking to an American, what is it that an average American 
doesn't quite get about China. Maybe it's a cultural thing, mm -hmm. yeah, because it is it is a mystery to us. What if if you could draw a picture and say what you don't get about China is this? What would this be? I think this is about making a distinction between the Chinese government, the Communist Party, and the Chinese people. Because when we talk about China, we tend to roll those things together. We need to recognize that you know many Americans, you know, naturally and have this warm feelings towards towards Chinese people, which is great. You know, I love that as as a person, I feel very well welcomed there. But at the same time, we need to recognize the Chinese Communist Party believes the law of the jungle. The might make it right. It has never changed. So don't expect uh, economic engagement somehow going to change them. No, they have a very singular goal. They want to make a, this a Sino-centric world order replace the liberal world order we have. So everybody will buy to the Chinese, you know, authoritarian rule. And we have to recognize that. Knowing, be realistic. Knowing we can never change that. But we can, but at the same time, we can do things to support Chinese people who, just like all the people around the world, have every right to freedom, freedom of expression, free, the free exchange of ideas, and the, and the liberty and the dignity to live a life that they want. People want to get backlash. Where do they go? Amazon, obviously. Amazon, always Amazon. And also, you've been writing for National Review and The Federalist and others. Uh, some, some terrific stuff. Any any website you want to drive them to? Yes, they can visit the uh, HelenRawleySpeaks dot com. Helen Raleigh Speaks. Uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans, and subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button too. You don't want to miss a single show. <laughs>